Yeah. Nick Hawks, welcome to Hey Chow, and thank you for joining in down to come and chat to me. Yeah, my pleasure. It was a uh, nice drive until until we hit London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the traffic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you sent me the, the the estimated time arrival, I thought he's only given a half hour bracket, like London, an hour <laughs> by by car anyway. Yeah. Well, I I actually st- um, because I stopped, I I was going to get a coffee, and I thought I won't because of the traffic. So I just got myself a, a Red Bull straight and filled the car up and, and just crack on mm. uh, and I'm glad I did uh, to be honest yeah uh, so just at the end of the icebreaker there we were talking about um, you mentioning I oh know it was in between the icebreaker actually when the camera was off were you talking about that you've you, you're, you're an open book in terms of topics conversation and that you've done podcasts which have quite a high uh, like a, a lot of in inverted commas pro IRA yeah. listeners yeah. so what have you been doing and why uh, and why does that what do you think about that like why does that yeah I think because I mean two years ago I I finished my sort of career really as security management I've done 22 years in corporate security and I just had a a a light light bulb moment while I was sat in um, at home in the Hague at the time Uh, and I just thought I need to do something slightly different here um you know, very easy to plod on with life and, and, and just go with the flow. So uh, writing a book was, was for me, was important. Uh, but I didn't want a Bravo 2 Zero type book. Um, it, I wanted the book to be about helping people who hit a brick wall based on what I, what happened to me, uh, if that makes sense. So, so Nicole Johnson, who unfortunately passed away uh, six weeks ago, she is very left wing feminist uh used to work for gordon brown uh as a, in communications uh and the first meeting was was her telling me to bog off <laughs> I'm, I'm not the person to, to write your book um and uh so when we got chatting and and i explained how i wanted the book to go she was hook line and sinkered with it she thought what a fantastic i totally different um, Can you elaborate more on why? Yeah, it's it, because it, it's um, it's quite heartfelt, really. Um, it, it, it you know goes through a lot about my marriage as well. Um, that after thirty years, sort of uh, came to an end, uh, and the reason being is we drifted apart. And when when people work away for long periods of times, uh, it does. So over a glass of wine, really, uh, we amicably uh, separated. Um, and and I've got a massive amount of respect for my ex-wife. She she was always there when my four kids were growing up. Like you know, I so I was off gallivanting around the world, first militarily, and then and then in corporate security. She's always been the person that's kept it all together, the the glue. Um, and I'm very close with uh, with all my kids. Um, so I I didn't want you know something like a separation and, and we're not officially divorced but I, you know, I didn't want the separation to ruin that relationship uh, so I gave her the house we had a big five bed barn conversion just outside Hereford Kim you can have it um, you know because uh, yeah she now nah, she deserved it uh, if I'm a solicitor thought I was mad as that <laughs> what the hell are you doing mate but at, at the time I lived in Monaco um, well lived in Monaco I was in hotels in Monaco for three years so so the house issue wasn't wasn't a major drama uh, if that makes sense i was a bit gutted she sold it uh, in the end um and um she uh she brought a house in Hereford itself purely because she's got a business up and running called kiki's uh on st owen street uh very dog friendly uh with my daughter um um, and it's a great little place so uh, yeah they're, they're doing great was it a coffee shop yeah it, it's yeah coffee shop stroke uh, smoothies uh, I shall be stopping in next time I know yeah it, I tell you what there's some far too healthy green looking <laughs> things that, that people will buy but yeah I'm, I'm, I'm straight there like, latte and a sandwich will do me uh, yeah. if that makes sense so the book why is the book that? why was she hook line and sinker what is the yeah. book heartfelt yeah life yeah. Can't have just been that. Yeah. Well, well it was. Uh, she she actually liked the the, the fact that um, uh, an SES, you know, because everybody's got this impression that SES guy is six foot tall, macho, blah blah blah. Um, whereas the story that we're trying to say was all the all the the soft side of it uh, of life as well. Um, you know, and being separated from your kids and and all that. It, it, it was just a different. 
um, you know, what SES guys are really about, uh, which is predominantly family, family orientated. Um, most SES guys are married, all got kids, uh, and people tend to forget that. Um, uh, and, and I always find uh, found that if you're on operations Northern Ireland for instance and you came home having a family around you was, was great grounding uh, because you'd, you'd be doing some you know nasty over in Northern Ireland one minute uh, you'll be back in Hereford and, and my um, Kim used to say to me right Mick do you want to you pick the kids up now like you know so so you had no no time really to to dwell on what what you'd been doing over wherever like you know, um, and it, uh, to be honest, it, it was just good grounding you know picking the kids up you know and whereas I, I suppose the uh, the married uh, the non married lads you know they they could dwell on it you know because they sat in the block or sat in the house you know on their own having a few beers or whatever. When you've got four kids, you, you can't do that like you know you. Yeah, running around like a lunatic getting jumped all over because the mm. kids were really young then mm. uh, so um, so she liked that side of it it, it was more the human element uh, as opposed to an SS robot and guns and back, you know explosions and all that type of um, so hence you know it's not a Bravo 2-0 it, it, it's, it's all about life um, the hiccups you had you know I, I went for a, a trial with Lincoln City he never got picked um, my life crumbled straight away. Um, I then joined the junior parachute regiment, got a pin in my ankle, told I could never parachute, you know, so two major incidents uh, while you're still quite young. Uh, but you just bounce back from it. Uh, you're just having that resilience, really, uh, of, you know, sod it. Well, let's, let's go with plan B. So the the pen in my ankle never stopped me parachuting. Uh, I've always been thought of as a, a bit of a rebel, uh, non-conformist, uh, which is probably why I wasn't a very good camp soldier. Um, you know the the old berries around the ear and all this sort of you know your cap badge and um, always getting bollocking for <laughs> you know not dressing the same way as everyone else and stuff like that. So so I always knew at some stage I was I was going to head to Hereford. Um, and, and most of the guys are, are, are roughly this, of the same ilk. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not camp soldier orientated, like, you know. And, and to be honest, Tutu uh, is not a camp soldier environment. Uh, it's, it's more individual, um, express yourself, um, and uh, more hands on. How do you think, um, how do you think, what's your opinion of how the British, so the British Special Forces capability and um and also the, the units special duties units as well and security services units have evolved since you were working with them because obviously you you are, your background in terms of special duty special forces is yep. extensive obviously you've got two two the obvious you've got 14 int you got mi5 and there's a there's probably a bunch of others that i can't recall off the top of my head what's your opinion on the way things have evolved in terms of our capability from what they were when yeah. you were directly involved with them to now completely different uh, and and the reason I say that you know talking to the kids and uh, and we're still living in Hereford as well so uh, but it's it's um, it's a world change uh, the, the way they operate a uh, lot more professional I would say now um, you know we used to wing it quite a lot uh, great term uh, you know because we at, at the time we didn't have the best equipment uh, dealt what we dealt for so I've got all the Gucci kit um, but we used to make it work, uh, and that was the the difference with uh, two two guys. You know that you you can give them the crappiest kit ever, the hardest task to do, and that, and they'll just they'll make it work. Uh, they'll, they'll just get on with it. Um, whereas now, uh, you know, they, the the fourteen in is no longer fourteen in. It's you know. Uh, That's all right. Yeah, absolutely. So so they they're, they're um, <coughs> more professional. I would say more. Because in the old days they weren't they weren't soldiers, um, you know, because they'd come from all different backgrounds. Uh, Navy uh, provided quite a few people. Now a Navy guy is not a soldier. Um, he might he might think he is, but they do a little stint of uh, close target recce, um, especially in the urban environment uh, where they have got to put green kit on, um, and uh, and they and they they struggle somewhat uh, because it, it's a different environment. Uh, but they pass the course because they, you know, they pick things up nice and quickly. Uh, but they're not soldier soldiers. Whereas I think now um, uh, a lot of that element is being a soldier. Uh, so it's a lot. I think it's a lot more difficult for 
someone of a Navy background or an RAF background, for instance, uh, coming in to do pure surveillance, uh, th there's more to SRR now than what there was with 14 in because 14 in was pure uh, surveillance uh, and technical stuff as well. Whereas SRR are uh, uh, more akin and, and uh, with working with the regiment. A um, lot of females. Uh, I'm not a big fan of people saying that they, the regiment should, you know, should hire, you know, should have women in there. Um, uh, unfortunately, SAF selection is not geared towards females, and we, we understand that. Um, but you always get these people bleating on the liberals, saying, you know, you, you need to open your door and blah, blah, blah. But what's the rationale, Mick? Explain the rationale that it's not geared towards females. It's not geared towards people, uh, purely because, um, uh, put it this way, some really good, tasty individual, Parachute Regiment, Royal Marines, bail SAF selection. So to expect a female to, to, you know, be able to do what they fail to do, uh, and a lot of it is because of the equipment you carry in, uh, the distance, and it, it's just really not geared to a female. Um, well, I think, I think a better way of putting it is it's not geared towards people who aren't physic are extremely physically capable. And that includes a proportion of men, and that includes a higher proportion yeah. of women. It's yeah. not about the sex, is yeah. it? Yeah, really? yeah, yeah. Uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and the the thing, I I'm not putting putting a female under pressure to pass essay selection because I, I think three or four maybe have attempted, um, but crashed and burned quite 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 early on, uh, if that makes sense. And and uh, for us, you know, we expected that. You know, you, you don't expect. I, I'm, I've no doubt at, at some point in time a female will will do it, um, but probably not any time soon. And the reason being is they don't need to pass SAS selection. Go to SRR uh, and do the surveillance stuff because if a regiment need females, they'll just go and borrow, borrow them. They've been doing it for years. Uh, you know, we used to, when I first joined the regiment, um, we had uh, two uh, females working with the regiment, especially doing uh, close protection stuff and that lot. But they were seconded from uh, 14 in. Um, because the 14 ink girls are actually quite capable um, you know my last two years in the regiment I used to teach all the CQB stuff for uh, the 14 ink people uh, and some of the girls coming through were top notch mm. so why put them under pressure to run up and down hills and, and all that sort of stuff uh, just so that they can say that they're you know they're, they're, they're badged SAS um, well, uh, you know, it, it well, just, <laughs> for, well, for the same reason, like yeah. you did it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, maybe not the same reason. But yeah, yes. I, 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 but it, but it, it does put a lot of a lot of uh, pressure, I think, on a, an individual to do it. Um, and and SAS selection is hard enough as it is. Um, so my my youngest son was uh, four days old when I went on selection. Uh, and you just have to blank all that out completely. Uh, and there was a guy, when I was in the jungle, uh, there was a guy from the Royal Signals. Uh, he engaged in conversation. Uh, oh, mate, you know, I, I hear you've got a young... And I, and I fobbed him off. I uh, wasn't interested. Um, he, he sacked it the next day. And I think it was a bit of a cry for help that he... Uh, he wanted to engage with someone of the same ilk, you know, young baby, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I, I wasn't having anything to do with it. And, and he canned it because he was having second thoughts. Um, and he was thinking family. Uh, and, and I literally had to... Do I feel guilty? No, not really. Because if I'd have engaged, it, it could have um, started playing on my mind as well. Yeah, you need family. acute focus. Yeah, right. absolutely. So so any any... Outside interference um, has a massive sway whether or not you're going to pass or fail. You've got to be a hundred percent up for that, up for doing SAS selection. And and any, it's it's like injuries on the first bit when you're running up and down hills. Uh, you can't afford to get an injury. You, your aim is to to start test week, no injuries, <coughs> absolutely zero injuries, so that it gives you then a really good chance of, of getting through it. It's the same in the jungle. Uh, when you're in the jungle, no outside concerns. Concentrate on what you're going to do because the jungle is obviously the hardest part. And because of the environment you're in as well, um, you need to be 100% focused. 
because some of the stuff you do in the jungle uh, is actually quite dangerous and and you know you, you can't be having someone in there uh who's having second thoughts and this uh, you know they, they need to be focused uh and that's why i never engaged with the the individual and and that was his choice you know he unfortunately with the jungle when 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 one person sacks it um it has a domino effect uh when one goes quite a few go there's been a lot of SAS selections where nobody has volunteered to to fail in the jungle um, because no one's been that first person. But once that first person does go, it, it does have a massive... And, it, and on my selection, um, I think we lost about nine people. Voluntary withdrew mm-hmm. from uh, from the jungle phase itself. Some, some selection, none at all. Uh, they don't do it. But it, it only takes one to... To can it and uh, and and it does have that domino effect. Yeah. So so yeah. So females, um, fantastic. You know what they do is great. What they bring to the party, doing all the covert stuff. You know I've worked with some very good females who who are very good at what they do. Do we really need to put them under pressure to just you know get their berry and a blue staple belt? Yeah, that's the thing, isn't yeah, it? It's, it's and it. it uh i think if you even talking about all uh, you know changing the standards to accommodate female uh, like no, no no not to accommodate changing the standards to make it easier to pass um with less physical capability whether you're a man or a woman that undermines the whole thing you take yeah, it away from it yeah, there will yeah. be yeah there will like as you said there will be a woman woman pass it will happen yeah it just takes in yeah. the same way as yeah. you know in the same way as, as when blokes pass it it's when the, when the blokes pass it, it's not just because they're physically capable. All the right situation needs to be in the right the right the right person yeah. in the military at the right time that the Herif, that yeah. Herefords mentioned, yeah. or any special force, you know, SBs mentioned, and then they think I want to go for that, and then they start training at the right time, start selection at the yeah. right time. They get on, you know, they, from getting the trees and being in the right mindset, mm-hmm. like you said, all of that needs to come together. There are there are females out there, just like there are males out there who, yeah. who are more than physically capable of passing yeah. but they aren't in the right place at the right time at the moment to yeah. be, get yeah. into the position you know, to we, do it. we used to have this conversation with the P Company uh, and the Marines um, and, and then now we're, I think we've two or three uh, girls have passed P Company mm-hmm. uh, two or three have passed the Commander course you're right at some stage I just don't think it will happen well, I'm alone. <laughs> I think, I think oh, it's gonna, yeah, no, because I'm looking at statistics, really. Um, you know, when you think uh, parachute regiment probably send per selection about forty people, um, and maybe four or five will pass out of that. Um, female turns that turns up, so we've had three females turn up, different selections. And how many? Uh, oh, what three have turned up for her? Oh, you mean P Company? Uh, no, for Hereford. Hereford, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, a couple never even got past the, um, what's the, the beat up start. Uh, the briefing so, course. Yeah, so, yeah, which which is new to me. I, I didn't, what's the briefing course? Um, what which happened I, you I, then? You just turned up and day one was selection. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Nothing before that. There was yeah, no, there was no filtering. No, not never that. <laughs> yeah, no, you just rocked up, really. Uh, yeah, you turned up at the Sterling Lines when it used to be the old Sterling Lines at, uh, at Red Hill in, in Hereford. Um Turn up on a Sunday. Uh, you then did a uh, a BFT on the not a BFT, a CFT on the Sunday. Eight miler. Bizarrely, some people failed it. Uh, running around Pontrolas, uh, some people failed it. There was a young lad who. So there was we had a four man room. There was two two lads from um, Pathfinders, uh, me uh, and uh, and a lad who's military dog handler, uh, Betcor. And this was on the Sunday morning, and the poor old vet, he was, on the Saturday night, he was on duty um, uh, at the officer's mess with his dog. Um, no no support, backup from his unit when he came. So, unfortunately, they failed the, um, the safety pretty miserably, which was great for us, because it meant that we had more room in the, in, in, <laughs> you know, so, so his bed went up, and, you know, any, any sort of de- decent kit that he had, you know, just leave it there um, and, and it was strange because they uh, that was it then that all three was all past like you know so he was off so he left on day one six months later the three was still there like you know so bizarre but that that's the difference between some units supporting 
uh, their blokes going on selection because a lot of, a lot of units actually feel as if you're deserting um, you know your old unit to go to a two two uh, well actually you, you're giving your regiment a bit of kudos if you pass uh, and and that's how really they, sh- they should look at it because there's a lot of unit I was quite lucky two nine commando uh, who I was with up in Arbro gave me a massive amount of support uh, you know they gave me two weeks um, with a Land Rover. Uh, to go and do all the the recce routes around uh, you know Sandy Bridge and and on the Brecon Beacons, and that's fantastic because it it just gets you into that m- mindset and understanding uh, the routes, which is quite important. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than turning up on selection having never done uh, the Penny Fan, for instance. Mm. Uh, so some units are, are quite good, and generally the the people that will pass uh, are normally the people that have had good support from uh, their units because selection is not the sort of thing you do um, where you haven't had that that beat up and that that train so I think the the, the thing that they do now the briefing course I think is is brilliant um, because it, it just puts everybody on a level playing field there was a massive unlevel playing field in our day you know the paras were all there switched on you know they, they'd done it Commando forces, Marines, and that lot, same ilk. Uh, but then you got some of the other units turning up, uh, obscure units, I suppose, fully capable of passing selection, uh, but let down by by their units without because they never got the the preparation. And that's why I always say that when I pass selection, the the first bit up and down the hills, which is the easy part, apparently, um, I always class myself as being lucky uh, to pass that. Um, why, why is that? Well, I, I, I mean, I failed, uh, failed my first one. I, I was quite bizarre, really, um, because I, test week, second day of test week, um, I woke up in a helicopter. Um, and the reason being is it was 1986, and uh, it's the first time ever that, that they cancelled test week or postponed test week uh, because of the weather. Really, really bad. So the weather hadn't improved a week later. Hadn't improved, so... Guess what, lads? We're just going to go for it. Um, and uh, and unfortunately, if you're the first person off a truck uh, doing a route, you, you're going to be trailblazing. Uh, and on the second route that we did, which was Elam Valley, which is hard enough as it is because it's quite boggy, uh, my name got called off and I, and I was first off. Um, so, and, and bear in mind, the snow was up to your crutch, uh, plus the weight of the Bergen. So it was hard going. But because you're keen as mustard, you know, you're determined, blah, blah, blah. I I actually got to about the fifth checkpoint and the chief instructor, or something where you were up there. How far uh, is that in then? Oh, uh, it's probably two thirds of the way around. And they... Uh, How far is the route in total? The route in total was probably 25 kilometers, okay. something like that. So... Um, so fully into it, um, and, I, and I thought I was, was doing all right, and no one had overtaken me, for obvious reasons. It was quite difficult to overtake someone. Um, but they advised me to step off, uh, go and take my burger off and go and have a, have a brew, uh, go and get a cup of tea. Um, totally ignored that advice, because I, you know, as you do, keen as mustard, yeah, I'm fine. Because I, I, I thought that was maybe a bit of a test. Yeah. Um, so I ignored it. Um, all I remember is going up to the final checkpoint um, and then waking up in a helicopter. Uh, and it wasn't until when I was in the sick bay um, back in Hereford, uh, the DS came up and, and explained what had happened. And he said, what happened, mate, is you came up, you took your burger off. I told you the next grid reference, which was the final checkpoint. And it was all downhill uh, from there. So quite easy going, I suppose. Um and I picked his burger up, put it on, and ran in completely the opposite direction. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, so they, they, they obviously knew there was something amiss here. Um, and rugby tackle me, brought the helicopter in. And, and it was just a bizarre feeling of waking up in a helicopter. Hang on, so, so you, you started to go mentally because of the conditions? Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd gone completely. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, yeah but I, I hadn't recognised that at all. So what all. was the condition? Uh, it was exhaustion, um, a bit of hypothermia thrown in with that as well because it was it was really bad weather. 
So when they said get a brew, they knew like you yeah, were fucked. Yeah, absolutely, and that's me being a dickhead, ignoring the advice, <laughs> and I should have stopped and had the thing. But you know, yeah, when when you when you're on SS selection, you just everything is a test. You you think everything is a test, uh, and you just want to go full out all the time, uh, just to. Um, but the worst feeling in the world is is pain in selection because I actually thought that they would allow me to continue. Because on when you do the hills, uh, you're allowed one gypsy's warning, as they call it, and um, and I and I just thought ah, that's my gypsy's warning. <laughs> I'll be good to go tomorrow. Uh, and the training major came in and said, "That's you. Uh, you know, you're off. Like you know, wrote a fantastic report back to uh, our bro saying, listen, let's get Hawksy back on the the summer course.' Um, and unfortunately, that all went out the window because I I then met my uh, future wife mm. uh, so then then put it off so so yeah it's um, uh, yeah it was a bit bizarre because you know I was dedicated to to passing this election and then not passing it um, was a bit of a kick in the teeth and and you know bearing in mind that a lot of people that do selection it's their be all and end all uh, it's they they're, they're going to do selection but don't get I'm getting out uh, and, and that's how they, they felt I see some great soldiers, the best soldiers, yeah. leave because they oh. uh, they they for some reason they end up not passing selection two or three times. And do you know what? The majority I've seen, I'm, I'm, I've seen, I've seen some great soldiers. I mean, probably three or four, and almost every single time they have just had bad bad luck yeah. on the selections yeah. they failed. You, you know that's why uh, my earlier comment I class myself as being lucky um, because of you you just alluded to there. The, there's some brilliant young lads out there uh, who have done selection but the uh, and would make fantastic SES soldiers but their bodies have just given up on them uh, they've picked up an injury or um, bug bites jung- jungle bug yeah, bites yeah absolutely uh, you know a bit, a bit of driftwood sort of falling down on you and all this sort of thing yeah it's uh, there is a lot of luck uh, involved in in get yourself through selection especially that first bit um because when you when you think when they do the fan dance um you know that's really cutthroat massively cutthroat because the, there's no there's no second chance on on fan dance and some sometimes some people used to have it on the second day of selection um because when when i first did selection it was a four week period uh so that hill so the first week uh was learning a map read uh, and and you know and it it was a bit really? fast really? yeah really? yeah really? absolutely it was a bit farcical really uh, because you 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 just went on on route marches you know and and everyone took it in turns. Why were they doing that? Why were people not because people weren't turning up with the ability to map read? No, uh, I think it was just the way it had run for for many many oh, many okay. years, uh, and then they obviously clicked on the fact that you should be able to map read before <laughs> yeah. you come here, yeah. and that's when it went and that's when it got shrunk down so i i think i probably did the last four week one uh and then when i went back so the one when the one i came off was four weeks uh the one that i passed on was three weeks back to three weeks because they cut out the uh that nonsense ready and it was nonsense uh you know it got but i think uh, it sussed people out because people used to come and think oh you know that first week you know I can get myself heel fit and stuff like that and that's not how SAS selection should be you know you should be good to go from day one so they they then some courses they had the fan dance on day two we were lucky it was on the Friday so you had a week really uh, and then you did the fan dance but the fan dance is quite brutal um, because you can have an off day uh, you could be the fittest guy in the world, have an off day, and you're off. You're off uh, because there's no time limit. The, the, you don't know what the time limit is, and literally, it's like a horse race. Um, you know, the, the instructors they all get together and go. You know, decent weather. Uh, it's nice and sunny. Ground's not too bad. <laughs> Cut off time is uh, three hours fifty, and they're just a red line. You below that red line you're gone or on that red line and below gone and that and that's where you lose 70 odd people 80 odd people in one day uh it, it is quite brutal but it is it's a, a sobering um experience that yeah that you you know that you need to do your homework 
especially in the hills and stuff like that. And this is where the, the young lads who turn up who don't have that um, backing from their units, they tend to suffer. Um, but I've seen really, really good guys who have literally gone on to, to be stars in the regiment struggle um, because they're having a bad day. Um, and they were uh, like a hair's breadth away from failing, mm. uh, failing the fan dance like you know, because um, mm. because that, that you know that is one thing that is um, really because bro- everyone assumes that SAS selection is a bit like that stuff that you watch on telly, you know, people shouting and screaming, but it's none of that. No, no one shouts at you at all because they they want self motivated people. Um, and it, you know, trying to explain that to people that have watched Who Dares Wins, you know, isn't it brutal? Is that is that what it's like in real life? Well, no. Um, and and that and that's why people are, are, are drawn and attracted to the SAS because you're treated like adults. You know, there's none of the bullshit side of it. And uh, do you think that show though, in particular, is um, is a good thing for, for from the perspective of? Like public, not public relations, but public opinion of special forces. No, I, I don't actually. Oh, okay. uh, sadly, uh, I and I think probably Billy's the Billy Billingham is probably the best person to because he he was actually an instructor on the on selection, real selection, uh, and then suddenly he's on there and I, and I did chat to him about it and he said, "Make TV. It, it's it's what you know. You, you can't run an SAS selection how it's really run because." People would just fall asleep. <laughs> you know, there's no shouting, there's no screaming, blah, blah. You know, they just send people off in the hills and then you come back down and, you know, it's, it's not great TV. So it, it, it gives a massive, um, it, it, you know, it's made, you know, people like Billy and stuff like that uh, and Jason Fox or whatever, household names, I suppose. But it's not SAS selection uh, it, and it's nowhere near it. Uh, if, if that makes sense and it, I suppose if you speak to anyone that has been through that and been on selection they'll all say the same thing what a load of bollocks <laughs> you know but for the civvy watching it um, yeah they, they, they love it you know but it but it's nowhere near it like you know no no comparison um, if I mean As, especially when you get a female <laughs> uh, you know a female wouldn't it that would never happen <laughs> uh, if I, but no. you know it, it's TV. Uh, you know what I mean, and and uh, you know I don't I, think it's damaging for the opinion of of uh, SF. You know I don't think so. I yeah. think um, I think people you know people who don't know any better. Yeah. Watch yeah. it and think, oh god, that looks hard. Yeah. Those those SAS guys must be really <laughs> tough. <laughs> you know, you know yeah. what I mean. You know you don't know anything else. You know, yeah. You could, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean to be to be honest, because I mean you look at the lads that are actually on it. You know they're they're all really decent lads. You know what I mean, and and I. I love Billy a bit, you know, because I've known him for so long, like, you know. Um, but, you know, when the, the way it's portrayed is, you know, it, uh, totally different to, to reality. We know it. Uh, it's a bit like military guys watching a war film. That would never happen, you know. Like, um, but for the average civilian, uh, civilian that watches it, they love it. And, and it's great TV. Uh, so long may it continue, uh, if that makes sense. But, you know, mm. comparison-wise, chalk and cheese. Yeah, uh, obviously. Do you know the other interesting thing it's done is is I say interesting. I think it's opened up. It's get, it, it's opened up um, to much more much more people leaving SF and things like that. Alternative career pathways. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I don't just mean on the TV, but just by the fact that those guys being on that show and doing that thing. Yeah, they all have their own books. They all have these spin-off things. They all have their own businesses. I think. I think it just provides. Hey, look. Hey, you don't just need you just need to get out and be yep. consultant here or risk management here yep. or you know bodyguard here. There's all this other stuff you can do, which I, I think is great. I think we're so yeah, narrow-minded absolutely. when yeah. we leave. Yeah, no, no, not narrow. Yeah, narrow-minded when we leave. And I'm speaking obviously. I'm not SF. I'm speaking from my background. Yeah, narrow-minded when we leave. That the more opportunities were shown yeah. the better yeah, like, uh, look at um, Jay Morton is a perfect example yeah. I think Jay Morton was on the show for a couple of series on one series at least he's a racing he's a racing driver now you know and he, went, he went from Paris now he's a racing driver so he's got out and he wouldn't have been doing that if the show hadn't existed yeah. you know do you yeah. know what I mean does that yeah. make sense uh, yeah it does absolutely it, you know it's funny because I, I was having a glass of wine with Billy uh, in the Cozy Club Hereford and, uh, and uh, talking about how Hawks and Co is going and he said, mate, never ever forget SES. 
and and then three he says because they'll open uh, quite a few doors so so a lot of our a lot of our stuff i have the the sas badge on there uh, as part of the thing and and we're now we're now branching out into going doing motivational talks um i gave one hawks quite and doing it yeah yeah oh, great i mean you're doing it through the company so yeah, yeah 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 through through hawks so i've got a slightly different banner so because we do, uh, we're trying to get into rural uh, security based on the fact that we used to break into farms over in Northern Ireland, and so we know how criminals operate. And <laughs> so it was the old, the old, you know, the old poacher turned gamekeeper mentality. Uh, so we we can really help the, the farm industry. We, we've all already been down to Dartmoor to help farm. I'm not a big fan uh, of the farm industry um, because they can do a lot more to help the average farmer. Uh, the average farmer doesn't have a lot of money, uh, struggle, uh, they're getting pressure from the supermarkets, uh, rural crime, you know, they'll lose a tractor and, you know, insurance companies, um, yeah, we'll get you a new one, but, but by the way, your insurance premiums are going to go skyward. So the average farmer, and you look how many farms have actually ceased to operate now. Uh, one because they can't get insurance, uh, they they become in, totally uh, uninsurable, uh, uninsurable, um, and, uh, and that's why their suicide rate is 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 massively high. Um, we should be helping these people a lot more. So I got calls uh, from a farm in Dartmoor saying, can, you know, can you help us out? Um, and how much how much is it going to cost? I said, well, um, Hereford to pay the fuel from for me to get down to. Plymouth uh, or Dartmoor um, and a bacon sandwich and, and that'll do like you know so we went there spent four hours four four or five hours down there um, going through rural situation awareness um, teaching them how to deal with confrontation so you basically did this for free then yeah uh, yeah, yeah absolutely and and the reason being is they deserve it you know what I mean they, they don't have a massive amount of money um, so what, what we're trying to say to the NFU and the insurance companies is you tell me what the, where the problem farms are and we'll go and, we'll go and help them. We'll put an arm around them. The, the NFU and, and the, the big, you know, NFU Mutual, the big insurance companies, they, they're blowing all the bridges. And, and it's the same as the rural crime units. The rural crime units work really, really hard, but they're underfunded and they're undermanned. Um, and they going back to the Dartmoor farm. First question was when? When's the last time you uh, had a chat with a policeman? Five six years ago, um, because they're knock, knocking on doors and and you know hire. You know this is me. You know any problems? They also had forty thousand pounds worth of uh, you know the wrapping that you put round hay bales. Yeah. The so black. They, the black wrapping. Yeah. Or the white, or the yeah, white yeah, wrapping. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so they they had forty thousand pounds worth of wraps stolen from a barn. Um, rang they obviously rang the police. No response. Uh, right, here's the crime number. Um, now the sad thing about that, and this is where we can help really, is if the police are not willing to go down there. I'm not saying that we're going to go down there and do what the police do, but what we can do is we can put an arm around the farmers and say, listen. The reason that was stolen was, you know, let, let's let's see if we can help you out and improve your security. And, and the, because what happens at the moment is people will lose an item, tractor, um, they'll claim off the insurance, no improvement to the security. Six months later, criminals come back knowing full well that there's no improvement um, and they've nicked it once. Let's nick a brand new one now. Um, and it's that vicious cycle. So they ship in, the, in that situation, they're shipping it out. They are, and a lot of it is going straight over. So that night, a tractor will be over. Some of the criminals are quite canny, very clever individuals, to be honest. They're not in jail for a really good reason. Uh, but what they'll do is if they're concerned that there's a tracker on their vehicle, they'll stash it um, normally on a local, another local farm. They'll, they'll hide it away. Um, and then they'll come back to it two days later and if it's still there um, they'll, they'll then pick it up put it on a low loader and it'll go straight to uh, straight to the ferry port and gone uh, over eastern Europe uh, it's a uh, it's a rural crime is a massive stain really on the uh, on the farming industry um, but more needs doing for so the NFU and the mutual and stuff like that they, they need to be helping the, the, the farmer 
uh, a lot more. The average farmer, not not the big farms. I, I did a presentation uh, quite recently down in Wiltshire. Me and my daughter went down there. And they wanted, they wanted a different angle. Uh, so we went down there and we were sat there, typical police uh, briefings and stuff like that, you know, blah, blah, blah. All stood behind the dais giving their little presentation statistics and all this pants. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, uh, so we we were first up straight after um, af- after dinner. Uh, and I said, "Listen, uh, have you have you got a mic that I can just put on here? Because you know, I don't like standing behind it. You know, a bit of a robot, isn't it? I like to walk around and yeah. <laughs> and before I said anything, I said, "Listen, guys, don't get offended by what I'm going to say, but you need to know this." Um, you know, we've been talking to farmers. I said, but you're losing the hearts and minds. The hearts and minds is gone uh, because f- the average farmer has no respect for the police at all because they'll report £40,000 worth of stuff missing. You don't even bother going out there. Um, so that, that bridge that used to be there is completely gone. Um, and that's where we think we can help. And at the end of the presentation, um, and it was quite, you know... Direct. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's not, it's probably not, especially the senior people in there, they're probably not, who invited this guy? <laughs> <laughs> but the average sort of copper, and they, they actually said, mate, you can actually teach us. Uh, what what you teach the farmer, um, it'd be worthwhile us knowing what you're teaching them, uh, because they are massively underfunded. And when you think Wiltshire is the, the second largest county in England, eight people. They've got eight people from the rural crime unit covering massive area. Now the NFU pump a lot of money into uh, the the uh, the sort of not the individual rural crime units, but the the national rural crime unit. But only so much filters down to the regional uh, or the 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 you know the um, the, the small rural crime units, and uh, and it, it doesn't really improve what they've got. And when you've only got six people. Um, trying to cover all eight people I think the largest rural crime unit is um, Thames Valley and they've got 18 people mm. and that's the the biggest uh, and is the reason being is they've got that link from rural into the big big urban uh, the big urban or rural uh, yeah. uh, sort of areas and stuff like that it's so. a similar story across the board for the police yeah <laughs> well, across everything you know I was um, I, f- I hadn't realised about it was until I, I interviewed a guy called Ian Donnelly a couple of years ago now and he's next uh, chief inspector, I think he was, a Manchester Police. Yeah. Um, he's got a podcast called Tango Juliet Foxtrot, or had. I'm not sure if it's still going. Mm. But and he wrote a book about how the problem with police at the minute, like why it's in such a bad way. And when I was talking to him, he was given the example of, especially in rural areas or even just suburban areas, someone calls the police. He said there literally isn't. They've taken away all the small police stations. Well, can't can't fund them anymore. So police not only are there less of them, you have to travel further to yeah. go and you know it's like a half hour, forty five minute drive to go and interview someone about a theft, for example. Yeah. Um, and then I was talking to someone. You know, this is just anecdotal thing. I was talking to a copper who I didn't know was a copper. I knew when he was younger. And now it turns out he's a copper. He's in Essex area and he's in Chelmsford where I live. And I was talking to him about night time. Now, how, how many people drive on a night? And he said, if you, if I told you how many people we have available to respond to anything at yeah. night, he said, you'd be horrified. Yeah. Now, I'll read into that, and I'll say it's less than, it's two people or less in one vehicle, yeah. I'd suggest, yeah. because I'd expect at least two vehicles yeah. fully manned you know, to be available. And, and it's the same problem across the board. It you is. Know? And that, you know, that's why rural criminals operate, this is the professional gangs, one o'clock to four o'clock in the morning, no one's about. No. You know, no one's going to respond to an alarm. Uh, alarms, technical security, all that sort of stuff, waste of money. Um, because it holds no fear to the criminals. And, and the worst thing is, I'm not a big fan of security companies. Um, you know, I've been dealing with them for 20 odd years. Hang on, what have you got then? What yeah, got? <laughs> but this is why we're trying to, but this is why we're trying to be different, yeah. uh, if that makes sense. Because the, the average security company will, be, their mindset is how much, how much can we, we make on this uh, and actually you should be helping the fire and that's why we said listen you pay for the fuel bacon sandwich we'll come and help you because they needed help uh, if that makes sense the security company would never do that uh, you it's know, not they, a nice industry I've had no absolutely myself, yeah. and it's um, and it's a shame really because it's you know these poor people are trying to trying to keep the economy going everything else and so they need they need as much help as they can 
they're not getting it. The police are not being able to give it because they can't, uh, if that makes sense. The uh, NFU are not giving them the right, you know, uh, to, to issue guidelines uh, and procedures and that lot about security. If you issue that, any sort of security guidelines to a non-security person, you might as well speak Swahili. It'll go over the head. And it's the same as when a security company will go in there and say, right, what we'll do, we'll do a nice security assessment for you. Oh, by the way, that's going to cost you two grand just to get the assessment. Uh, and here's all the recommendation. And at the bottom of the recommendations is, you know, it's going to cost you about 20 grand mm. to buy all this technical crap. Uh, if I'm, and it is crap. Um, because until you actually change the mindset of the farmers, all that fancy gadget shite is a waste of time. Um, because the, the guy who's operating it will leave the gate open, you know, and, and, and that's fundamentally where it, it's, it falls flat. Because the, the key to rural crime is not the rural crime units, it's not technical security, none of that, it's a farmer, the farmer himself. Yeah, so, uh, so this is where we're trying to change that, that mindset and, and just do something different. Um, but but um, literally focus on the the farmer. Let's get him in the right mindset because you can go on any farm, any farm, um, and there'll be a key left in the ignition of either a vehicle, an ATM, uh, uh, not an ATM, um, all-terrain vehicle, um, quads, tractors, combine harvesters. Uh, the keys are in the ignition because it's their it's their culture. Uh, and that and that's the way they do it. So the the farm in Dartmoor got down there. Seven there were seven vehicles parked in the courtyard. Five keys in the ignition. <laughs> First thing we said when we went, listen guys, keys in the ignition there. When you walked out on the main road and you looked into the farm, three top of the range quads uh, and an all terrain vehicle All visible. In, in view. <laughs> and you like that? Listen guys, you know. And the and the worst thing really was they've got five. Uh, working dogs now these working dogs you put a lot of money towards them they're worth about 10 grand uh, purely because of what their skills that they bring to the table um, and they're just running around you know and you pick two or three of them up you know and, that, and that'll decimate the farm because all of a sudden they've lost their uh, you know their, their professional help uh, if that makes sense so so yeah we, we, we can do we can do better um, uh, but we need to go back to basics with with farmers and and get that mindset right. Uh, and and, and, th and this is where um, it's great having my daughter with me. Uh, cause, uh, the reason I got her involved in specifically the uh, the personal uh, personal safety situation awareness and and she does a breakaway and the the restraint training. Uh, is she's more believable. You know, if I do it, people are just, oh, yeah, but, you know, access is yes. Uh, but if she does it, uh, females, youngsters, they, they relate to Keely more than they relate to me. Uh, you know, we do the scary bit of why well, you need to be a bit more switched on. But when she starts doing the all the breakaway stuff, it, it's more believable. And yesterday was, was a classic example. You know, Keely got throttled six times, so six groups went through. Um, and she just picked, you know, one of the lads up, right, you know, throttle me, uh, you know, and, you know, you've got my permission to, to apply as much pressure as you can. Really? Yeah, and and, Jesus. and, and, and this is how to, to, to get, and, and people look at it and go, flipping hell, that's a little female that can just push that guy away, um, you know, get out of that move, like, you know, so it, 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 it makes it more realistic for them, uh, seeing a, you know, a little slip of a girl doing it. Uh, so she's been great. So when we're when we're dealing with farmers, and we're dealing with confrontation, um, a lot of the farm industry is female orientated. Uh, so again, they'll they'll relate to. What do you mean? Female orientated. Yeah, they're more lot, receptive to females. Yeah. The, well, there's a lot of farmers that are females. Uh, there's a lot of females in the farming industry. Uh, if that makes sense, you mm -hmm. know, it's not all. It's not a male dominated industry. There there are many many females out there. Yeah, really? I would have thought it was, but like it is predominantly male, though, right? It so it's is, not yeah, a higher absolutely. percentage as we think. Yeah, there, maybe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, I would say, um, you know, just about every farm, there's females working on it. The wives of the farmer, for instance. So, so what what we do, we don't just say, right, farmer. It's the family because the family have to buy into this as well. Because um, it's no good the farmer, you know, he's been taught. And then the, the wife goes out there and leaves the gate open. Uh, doesn't make any sense. Or the kids. 
Uh, so when we do this training, we train everybody. Uh, and it's the same as when we do active shooter training. Uh, again, slightly different. So the police do it their way, uh, marauding terrorist attack. Uh, but they, they, <laughs> they teach certain individuals of a, of a thing, um, of a corporation. So, you know, certain people get taught. Um, whereas we've been teaching this now uh, since the Paris attacks, uh, 2015. And we've been teaching active shoot all around the world, uh, initially with SBM. We as in Hawks, uh, no, SVM and... SBM. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then Hawks and Co, we went over to Houston uh, to teach, the, uh, teach SBM, actually, because uh, they've got no one there now to, to teach it. Uh, so we, we, we've been quite active on the active shooter side of it. But we tend not to teach the way the police teach. Um, run, high tell. Uh, we do run, high fight. Ah. And the reason the reason we do that, uh, so when the police say they'll go in there, so yeah, so, senior, yeah, so you explain this in, in, in basics. Yeah. People, yeah. So the police will, will go to an organisation and say, right, uh, um, your ten sort of prominent people, managers, blah blah blah, will teach you more order and terrorist thing. Now that's great until the person they've taught gets at the back of his head shot off, and then who's going to stand? So the, where we're different is we teach everybody so that everybody understands what their what their the options are that they have and it, and it, they're, they're obvious you know run run away, try and hide or run away if you can uh, but if you're on the seventh floor of a building uh, it's not going to go hide if you can so you know it, let's find some uh, you know proper places that you can hide maybe use a chalk to chalk a door toilets are, are brilliant. Because most toilets are inward opening doors, so and they've got no windows, obvious reasons. So they're ideal hiding places. You know, put a nice sturdy chalk under there. Um, you know, get someone to lie on the floor with their foot on the chalk, so they're not going to force it in. And if they do blast through the, you know, it's, it's going to go above you because uh, nobody shoots down, uh, not the average person anyway. Um, so teaching them all that. But the final one, which is quite contentious, I suppose, is the fight side of it. And the reason we do that is um, Christchurch. Um, and they, they, when you look at the footage of Christchurch, um, nobody did anything. This is the Christchurch, Christchurch school shooting. Yeah. Uh, no, the, the mosque. Oh, New Zealand. Yeah. 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 yeah the, in the mosque with the Australian guy. Um, and it, and it, it really, I, and I use the footage really as not to show anyone else because it's quite grim. Uh, but as a, as a lessons learned for me that, that doing nothing is no longer an option um, and, and what we try to explain is uh, same as a room like this so uh, there's, there's nowhere to go so if a guy walks in there with an AK uh, obviously, obviously you're going to shoot someone <laughs> but if a guy an average guy walks in with an AK-47 and there's 10 of us sat here someone needs to do something otherwise there's 10 of us going to be pushing daisies up for the rest of eternity so it's encouraging, you know, people to say, listen, your option is you need to take that guy out. And then what you're hoping on the day uh, is that someone grows a set and flipping goes for it. And if at the 10, if five people get shot dead, but they manage to overpower. Five have survived. Exactly. And doing nothing is 10. It, it, what you're saying is common sense, right? It's common sense to you, it's common sense to me. I, and I'd argue yeah. it's common sense to most ex-military. Yeah. Definitely common sense to most ex-army, right? Now, Christchurch, you mentioned there, I, I, when, I, when you were talking uh, about it, the run, hide, run, hide, tell, and run, hide, fight, I f- immediately thought of a situation, a really, uh, it was a high-profile one last year or maybe the year before in America, and it was a school shooting. Yeah, yeah. another school shooting. Yeah. And it went on for like an hour or so before any anyone challenged a shooter. Yeah. But the police were on the po- on point. They're yeah. not on point. They were on site within something like ten minutes. Yeah. And did nothing. Yeah. And you can hear yeah. the you can because it's obviously there's a footage of it. You can hear the gunman shooting. You can hear people screaming. There's there was uh, there was mothers trying to get into the school yeah. to go. I am fucking gonna go and get my child. Yeah, and, let as you in. Would do, yeah. and they sat there just letting it happen. Yeah, and if, yeah. I, I I remember watching it back because I, I watched through the whole situation after the fact, not live. Watched through the whole situation, thinking, "Am I going mad? You? Why is yeah. why is no one going in? Yeah. You know, it's it's the old adage of 
uh, um, the best form of, of defense is attack. Yeah. You, yeah. you can't, yeah. you cannot yeah. do nothing. And the longer something goes on, the worse it gets. Yeah. The thing they're least expecting is an immediate attack. Immediate yeah. attack. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. The thing is with the, the police training here, uh, and this is why we tend to ignore it, and that's no disrespect to the police, the police watching this. Love the police. Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, it's because it's all geared to a police response. Now, you know and I know that a terrorist incident is going to be done, dusted, and finished before the police even get there. So it's And the people in the firing line of any terrorist attack is not a policeman or military guy that, that people, you know, or the security guy. Yeah, it's probably the first one to be taken out. It's a general public, you know. It's it's a general public that need to understand, um, you know, what terrorism is all about, and and that's why. Funny story. We were so we got a head office in uh, Monaco, um, and we taught active shooter in Monaco, and all the skeptics. We're in Monaco, you know. The worst thing that happens in Monaco is someone drops a you know, the glass of pink champagne, and you know, and, the, and that you know, and that's a major incident. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we went down there. Said, "Listen, guys, you know, because what we what we're trying to do is trying to get every office um, all on the same sheet of music. So if you went to Brazil, you'd understand that if it, you know, if you went to Monaco, you went to um, China, um, Malaysia." Angola, Nigeria, wherever, you all, so all the, all the emergency evacuation plans, exactly the same. So no matter what office you went to, it was all the same and uh, you didn't have to change anything. And so when we did the active shooter, Brazil, all over the world, Monaco, skeptic, you know what the French are like, <laughs> you know, why do we need to do this? Literally six months later, attacking Nice, 87 mm. people dead. Most of our most of our employees live in these, and the feedback was, yeah, we're glad that we actually knew what what um, you know roughly what to do, like you know. So. Another another I can't remember why I didn't think of this. Another obvious great example of that getting straight in there would be Craighead in Nairobi. What would the casualty count have been in yeah, the Dusit to? Um, in that in that uh, shopping complex, yeah. what would the casualty count have been if Craighead hadn't been there and hadn't have gone straight in? Yeah, it yeah. would have been a lot higher than what it was. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the sad thing is, uh, is he was slated for doing what an SES guy is trained to do. You know, your natural instinct. If you've got a weapon in the back of your car, call me old fashioned. A bit like Northern Ireland, we've got a guy snatched. Guess what? We're going to get him out. Well, the way he's been treated is a fucking joke. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Fucking absolutely, joke. yeah. It's, it's absolutely, yeah. It's embarrassing. It's yeah. embarrassing. I mean, I, we can't. I don't want to go. Obviously, not going to detail on this, but I'm, I'm. I reckon you know probably a little more than what I know. Yeah, that kind of it. And, it, uh, it, it, it is, mate. What, what, what surprised me with it? Just quickly on it is. He is. He is the most. He is the best poster boy for special forces yeah. in the modern era yeah what i mean the story of it is just legendary and yeah. he in a lot of people's eyes is like a fucking god yeah he's the best poster boy for sf yeah you know for uh, in fact for british forces yeah. for british military yeah you know and uh, why why they didn't see that and i'm talking mod why yeah. they don't see that and why they had to resist against certain things like it's public about his book has been rejected yeah why yeah. are they resisting against this stuff is madness to me yeah, yeah. it's madness to me yeah yeah, yeah. No, I'm, it, you know it's funny because uh quite a few years ago uh there's a lad who was uh kicked out of the regiment um he was sort of deemed as as being a bit of a trouble he was a cracking lad uh, got himself in trouble once uh and, it, and he, got, he got absolutely hammered for it purely because you know his bosses didn't didn't back him up like you know and he was a really good guy so he uh, he was now out uh, he was a sibby uh, he was on a plane to south africa british airways flight to south africa um so it kicked off on the on the flight uh this lad said listen i can help you you know this is my background so he went over there filled the guy in uh you know smacked him and and calmed him down on the plane in the air yeah 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 calmed it all down uh, managed to get him uh, sort of strapped in and and he was actually sat with him so every time he tried to kick off he'd uh, just give him a quick slap to remind <laughs> him 
because uh, they put him in, they put him in first class out the way. Uh, so so this lad was sat with him. Uh, British Airways uh, when it landed, uh, they they organised for this lad to, to get picked up, uh, chauffeur driven car all the way, and they gave him I think it was round the world flights, you know blah blah blah. Now that he should have been the poster boy, mm. you know ex SAS guy, you know. Regiment, no, not interested. Bad lad. It's old school thinking. It's yeah, just, it's yeah. just, it's archaic thinking. Yeah, absolutely. You need yeah. to, you need to ride these waves of, of, uh, of like support behind these people yeah. and go. How can we take advantage of this? Yeah. It's, it's like it's like a, a corporation would do. Okay, but, yeah. you know, we rather he didn't follow the process. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but. It's working out pretty well for him, yeah, and he's yeah. looking pretty good. Yeah, so. you know, because when you think of it, if if he hadn't have done that, all the regiment lads would have slated him for it. I the B- on the BA, yeah. are you talking, Craighead? Craighead. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Blah blah blah. So he does it, which is his natural instinct to do, um, and then gets absolutely hammered for it. And, yeah, it's just a, a yeah, a ridiculous, really. Uh, yeah. But, yeah yeah no absolutely yeah fr- frustrating all around really but you're right you know he should be because every everybody you know the Ameri- you know what the Americans are like you know they, they would have treated it totally different and it's probably why he's probably more, more well thought of over in the States than over here like you know uh, sadly well I, you, if you look at it on stage with Trump you know what I mean? I yeah. say on stage, you know, the, like ex-president, yeah. you know, giving him and where's our where's our PM when he did that? Mm. Where's our PM when he did that? You know what I mean? Um, anyway, that is <laughs> <laughs> goodness me. Right, we um on the uh, I just want to come come back to um something you mentioned in icebreaker, Bosnia. Not aware of this story. <laughs> so you got you got captured yeah. in Bosnia. Explain this to me. Yeah, it's quite shocking actually. So, so I'd literally just finished two years doing undercover in Northern Ireland. Where, this is late nineties, I take it. Yeah, it? it was 90, uh, 93, 94, oh, 95, okay. something okay. like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, something like that. So At the height of the atrocities over there, I say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we we had quite a quite a busy period really uh, over in Northern Ireland. So I finished that. Um, uh, we then did a bit on the anti-terrorist team, and then and then we deployed to we took over from. Uh, a squadron, I think it was, doing the, uh, the change around. Um, and Billy and the boys had, had deployed before me. Uh, I was doing something else. and So I was a, a sort of late arrival. Um, so got over there. And we were tasked, really. We were up in a place called Beehatch, uh, which is in the, the sort of northeast of the country. Um, and it was a, an enclave, really, that had, had stood the ground. Uh, Serbs couldn't take it, um, and it was uh, five five core Muslims. Uh, a guy called General Dadakovic, uh, quite a, quite a robust individual, quite down to earth. Um, but he he sort of kept the kept the Serbs out. Great, great thing. So so that was where we were based. Um, now at the time we were we were tasked with um, so Billy had been out there about a month before me. And we were tasked, four of us, to set up a meeting between a Serb general and a Muslim general. Not a crowd, it was just two people. And it was really, the, the meeting was all to do with um, the, the peace lines, um, you know, where, where troops should be pushed back to and this, that and the other. Really ready for when the Daytona peace agreement came in. So, so it was just the, the little things that needed tying in. So it wasn't a special meeting or anything like that, so... So we set the meeting up there. Now, the day before, um, we wrecked the area, me and Billy, uh, and we, we actually went down to the Serb front line, um, had a chat with the Serbs, had a slivovich, uh, as you do, uh, in, in our coffee. Um, uh, had a really good chat with them, came back and said, yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll probably come down and have a chat with you tomorrow. Um, day of the meeting, set it all up. Two lads stayed with the UN people. Uh, that were it was a Danish organisation, so you know. Uh, but we we set the meeting up, so got the meeting going. Two lads stayed with that, and then me and Billy, same as what we did the day before, went down had a had a chat with the Serbs. On the way down, um, it was obvious that, that the situation was slightly different, um, unbeknown to us that because the general was now here, uh, they brought their decent troops forward. 
uh, and we the way the SAS operated in Bosnia at the time we, we just didn't look like UN um, never used to wear any insignia uh, no berries helmets body armor none of that sort of gash uh, you just went about with just normal DPM stuff and a, and a pistol uh, and crack on and the reason we did that uh, is when you're dealing with frontline organizations um, you need to earn their respect uh, you turning up with your helmet and uh, when they don't have it uh, you tend to lose that that respect. So, so we just used to because they were they were supplied pretty pretty yeah, um, absolutely sca- um, yeah scarce, absolutely right not a yeah, lot okay. yeah okay got it yeah, yeah absolutely it. so so that and we found it it worked really well um, and and a lot of it as well is the UN were under a massive amount of restriction so we'd be restricted so without having all that rigmarole we could just we just to be honest we we ignored. Um, any UN restriction uh, doesn't apply to us. And we just cracked on with it, like, you know. Uh, the Serbs and that lot and the, the Muslims obviously try to enforce it. You know, you can't come up here, uh, really, out of the way. Um, and, and we just used to get on with it. And, it. and it was great for General Smith or one of the generals who was down in, because he knew that he had these little four-man teams being able to send back, you know, proper reports, not... Uh, restricted reports because the UN couldn't couldn't actually get the information you know we just went out and got it so we set the meeting up went down there uh, slightly different now with the frontline troops um, and we spoke to them somewhat because they must have looked up and thought they don't look like UN um, you know there's flipping weirdo with long blonde hair and, and Billy um, just rocking up so uh, we think we spooked them um, because the people that we spoke to the day before had gone Ah, you know right, what I mean? Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so we were surrounded by about eight, eight, nine uh, Serbs, uh, all beards, long hair. Um, not a lot you could do. You, you're not going to win a, a shootout uh, when someone points an AK-47 at you. You know. So, yeah. Okay. Fair one. So they took our pistols off us, took magazines off, uh, took our maps, um, notebooks. So there's a lot of shouting when they did this, or it was just, yeah. oh, it was just point of weapons, eh? Yeah, no, it was yeah, a lot of shouting, a lot yeah. of hysteria, I suppose. But they dragged us into a house, um, like a like a farm building, uh, just off the main road. Did, did they think you were a military coup or something? Did they? They part of a, Did they think you were part of planning a military coup or something? No, like that? no, I, I, I haven't got a clue what they thought. But they, they because they they were on high alert because they they got their Serb general down there. So all of a sudden, these two misfits <sighs> that rock up uh, that don't look like UN. You know who who were they? Assassins so, or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it was just because it was different, I suppose. Mm. Um, so so they dragged us in there, and it, and it was a quick. You know, tactical questioning initially. You know, blah blah blah. Now, Billy, Billy spoke. He'd learnt a bit of serbo croat so he spoke a bit of serbo croat to them. I hadn't. Um, I'd literally been in country two weeks, um, Northern Ireland before that. I knew nothing. <laughs> so um, they were sort of talking to Billy more than what they were talking to me, if that makes sense. So, and our ID cards, bizarrely, there was one number different between on our ID cards, and and that's not relevant <laughs> oh, at the moment. But it, but it was, yeah. I, I <laughs> so when so when we then so they then decided that we needed to go further back. So they put us in a in a Land Cruiser, um, and there was a, a big, rough and ready lad was in the passenger seat. Um, there was a major who was doing the interrogation was a driver. Me and Billy in the back, so we off we went flying down the road, um, back to a place called Priador, and um, and me and Billy were just whispering to each other, uh, and it was great for us because we were we were seeing all the, you know, because no one had been this far behind <laughs> down enemy lines, you know, oh, fantastic, you know, oh look, <laughs> tanks, <laughs> great, ready, you know, getting trying to get all the information and trying to store it in your head. So we were whispering away, and then all of a sudden, uh, the, the, the major said something to, to this guy, and he spam round, or, you know, big lump of a guy, sort of turned round with his AK-47, and he cocked it, and, and me and Billy, automatic, typical squad is, you expect the, the AK to be already cocked, because <laughs> you're yeah. on the front line. Um, and for some reason, I don't know if it's nerves, or, but we... We started laughing, <laughs> which didn't go down too well. Because uh, we looked at each other and went, 
it's just cocked his weapon. So you were laugh, so you were laughing at the fact his weapon weren't cocked. Yeah, that, that it that wasn't. Was like yeah, ba- basically bad drills. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And that's what that's what squad is doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Front line troops, you'll be uh, <laughs> rounding the chamber at all times. <laughs> Fifty press ups, um, which didn't go down well. So, um, so that annoyed him. Obviously, annoyed the major as well that these two lunatics were now not taking it serious. So they were quite. Uh, from there, the, the atmosphere slightly changed somewhat. Uh, were you panicking up to that point? Not panicking, but were, were, were you fearful up to that point? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll say no and the reason being is I'd just gone back from Northern Ireland uh, if that makes sense so having done a lot of undercover work in that lot uh, and, and understanding a cover story to be honest some of the stuff that we do in, in Bosnia quite risque uh, if that makes sense so you expect either to be shot at uh, or certainly to you know so it, it wasn't unusual that at some stage someone was going to get captured or someone was going to get shot and killed, which is what happened. So, um, probably nervous, maybe, but not 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 overly, because uh, you know we just thought you know it's part and parcel of the job, I really. Uh, so we we got now down to Priador, uh, and they put us in a corridor. Um, quite a, quite an oldish corridor, um, and it, but it was one of the camps that um, uh, was on TV a lot uh, because they the Muslims that used to get taken there for interrogation uh, some used to disappear, um, but they never used to get fed, uh, and you, it was a bit of a throwback to the old uh, Jews from the Second World War, you know, emancipated people. Uh, so it was that camp. So. Um, I got dragged in first for interrogation, bizarrely. Um, uh, explained to them, using a cover story, because uh, the, the big five doesn't work. <laughs> you know, no right number, uh, not going to get anywhere. So the cover story, so my cover story was, uh, I've only been in country two, uh, two weeks. I'm a driver, I'm just a driver. I know nothing. Um, and they, they try to get as much, so, and you're like that. Uh, I ain't got a clue, mate. Nah, no, no, no. So... They got a bit pissed off and threw me out in the corridor. And then Billy got dragged in. Um, uh, and because Billy had spoken a bit of servo crap, they put two and two together and thought, Billy's the, the clever one. Uh, he must be the senior man. Uh, and Thicko out there, the driver, is a waste of space. So, you know, we'll ignore him. So Billy, Billy was in there for about an hour. Uh, he then came out uh, to put him in the corridor. I was, was, this, was it physical as well? Uh, it was outside. It was it was uh, intimidation, uh, kicking, um, the odd sort of slap, uh, knives, uh, sort of digging them into your wrist, pointing the weapon at you, intimidation. Uh, well, and we do that, you know. Uh, uh, you know, we we knew that it wasn't in their in their interest really to to kill two uh, two. We were gonna. I was gonna say UN because they didn't know we were UN, apart from the ID cards because the ID card said UN. So uh, so then so Benny got dragged in. So I, when he got thrown out, I was then expecting to be to be the next one in, you know. There, uh, but they came out. And they grabbed hold of Billy again, and, and yeah. So but he was in there for another hour. Blah 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 blah. blah. Thrown out, um, and I, you know, and all this time I'm just sat in the corridor thinking, you know, what's going to happen here. Um, Third time, again, Billy. Uh, so it was it was all all Billy, uh, you know, Mister Thicky in the corner, waste of space. <laughs> um, eventually, after about five interrogations, uh, they put us close together, um, and sort of Billy leant across and went, "Flipping out, mate. What what did you tell them?" I went, "Sorry, mate, but you know, I just said I'm the driver." But he said, "Yeah, but I'm the driver." <laughs> 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 and it was a typical, typical squatty mentality. Snooze, you lose, mate. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they, what they clicked on is the Serbo cry uh, that Billy was, and and that's why they were, uh, they were hammering him with all the questions, like you know, because uh, they just assumed that he uh, he knew more than what he was. What he was were they? What were they wanting to know? Just what unit you were? What you were doing there? Yeah, day? it was. And yeah, initially it was um, who he, that, I think they had an inkling. Uh, that we were SES and the reason the reason SES were not very well thought of by the Serbs because you had Sarajevo 
um, and uh, and it was a, um, uh, an SAS squadron, a uh, troop, sorry, uh, or patrol within the troop that had actually brought in uh, the fast air jets uh, onto uh, Serb, Serb forces before they actually took the town itself. So they were they were sort of looking for uh, SAS patrols. So they had an inkling that we were possibly SAS, uh, but no proof. Uh, all our maps and everything else was sterile, as, as uh, you're taught to do. So we had nothing on us really to to uh, to say that we were actually SAS, and we certainly weren't going to tell them uh, if that makes sense. So, so I think that's where their their interest was, was sort of spiked up. That they've, they've got two quite important people here. So how we how we got so that you know, so this is five six hours later. Uh, now in the meantime, the other two lads at the meeting, uh, the light infantry uh, had put uh, they had a warrior uh, midway between um, the the meeting place and and where we got taken, uh, no man's land, um, and they'd reported back ready that bloody Mick hadn't turned up, <laughs> you know, uh, some a miss here. Uh, so the two lads sat phone they rang uh Sarajevo, uh and uh, <coughs> called um general uh and he said listen no no drivers uh just go in and arrest the serb uh, general uh, tell him he's under arrest and that he's going to be taken to Bihać. and believe you me serb going back to Bihać, you know the place that they've been trying to get hold of for, for many a year i suppose um full of muslims was complete dread to them like you know so so he he had his own sat phone so he obviously got on the sat phone contacted his people and it all changed the atmosphere changed uh, all of a sudden we were you know uh, okay you know put in the back of the vehicle um, drove us back gave us our pistols back gave us everything back that we had was uh, and then sent on on our way so it was a bit surreal so literally walking back um me and billy are sort of looking at each other thinking well uh, that was a bit bit unusual but the good thing was is we never made a song and dance about it you know it wasn't it wasn't a big issue you know it was yeah you've been, been captured yeah you wake up in the morning and you know what happened yesterday oh yeah we got captured but yeah <laughs> no dramas uh, so we, we kept it really low key so the only people that knew about it were the other two patrol members the squadron commander knew about it and maybe one or two other people um, and obviously the general no one else so all the rest of the squadrons uh, or squadron uh, v squadron nobody knew about it and quite bizarrely when billy was on uh, who dares wins he uh, he started talking about escape and evasion and being captured and all this sort of thing and he was getting phone calls from b squad lads saying you've never been captured that's a lot of bullshit and he went, actually, <laughs> ah. we have, yeah. And uh, and that's really, really where it, it came to light uh, when Billy uh, started talking about it on uh, uh, on his um, uh, the Who Dares Wins thing, like, you know. Uh. So, yeah, so, um, so it, it's actually nice. So me and Billy, when we sit down and talk about it, it's funny how things are slightly different. You, you re- Two people, you remember things slightly different. Um, Billy alludes to the fact that um, the guy, when he turned around, he, he put the AK in his, in his mouth, and you know. Um, whereas I, for me, uh, that was a bit of a blank. I I don't remember that at all. Uh, if that makes sense, purely because I'm probably thinking of something else. So your power recall is is totally different to to someone else's. He can he can he can remember things of the camp, whereas went over my head like you know I didn't remember that at yeah all. that's especially true I think it's much more obvious when you have like situations like that which are high drama for what yeah. Yeah. I experienced that myself I won't go through the I won't, I won't regurge the story but I put I, um, I we me and a few others got interviewed by military police a month or so down the line yeah. after a, ba- a bad incident had happened so I, so we each of us got interviewed individually just to, to explain what had happened because yeah, yeah. people had been killed. And um, and then we, afterwards, we got together, we sat on a brew and we talked through, we hadn't talked through it yeah. s- since it had actually happened. After we talked to the police, we talked through it and in talking to each other, I realised I got 
a, 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 a chain of events completely the wrong way around completely yeah. but in my head and even to this day I'm convinced that's how it happened yeah but I I'm not convinced I believe no I remember that's how it happened the chain of events I think yeah but I also know I'm wrong because three other people remember it in a different way yeah so I'm thinking huh yeah, I miss yeah. It. and it's they're trivial things these chain of events but they're, they're that significant where I, sh- I should obviously remember how that happened but yeah. I don't yeah be- because again that power of recall especially and it gets worse over time right? yeah absolutely and, and I think I think because of the stress of the situation as well um, that, that clouds a lot of it uh, and all that so, and, and you're right you know over, over time I mean we're talking 93 mm. uh, and stuff like that I, I was on the, um, I was on a podcast talking about the HMSUs and um, and I called it the yeah, heavy mobile support unit. Um, and someone quickly said, it's not its headquarters, you know, and I'm like, hold on. I, I can't remember <laughs> that. I can't remember that crap from, you know, but no. Um, but yeah, so yeah, over, you know, we're, we're all fallible. Uh, as you get older, you recall slightly different. This is the problem with legacy prosecutions. <laughs> Is it not? Exactly. Well, uh, crazy. We, yeah, but we, we always say that if you, if you ever get dragged in, uh, the only thing you should ever, ever say is refer to my original statement and nothing else. If you've given one, yeah. 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 And this is the thing with, uh, yeah, this is, it's also something for, for people who are aware of themselves, anything that this happens. You know, I think, about, I, I genuinely, you know, fear for down the line, myself or colleagues, being dragged up in front of court for, for some reason I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You know, this is not me saying I've done illegal things, because I fucking haven't. But you never know what's going to happen, or even just as a witness to think, whatever, yeah. you don't know. When you look at what's happened in Northern Ireland over the years, you know. Yeah. Um, and and it's when you see the civilian side, the witness side and the civilian side, and I think that, do, do they realise that their memories may have been skewed on this? Their memory probably has definitely yeah. changed things because th- when you remember an event, you're not re- say like ten years online. You're not actually remembering the original event. You're remembering the last time you remembered it. Yeah, people don't realise that. Yeah. So it's like memories have Chinese whispers. Yeah, and it all depends on how vivid the or- original memory of it was, the original activity was, to how well you remember it in 20 years' time. Yeah. You know. the, the, the other thing about the, the historical side of it is the emotional side of it. And the reason being is uh, a lot of the IRA people that have been killed, it's all their families now uh, that are in arms. And the poor old squaddy, you know, his family's not screaming and shouting because he's accidentally uh, killed someone or whatever like you know so so or allegedly, or allegedly accidentally killed yeah someone. absolutely so it, it's the poor old squaddy on his own whereas you've got all these families saying oh yeah you know because Bloody Sunday is a classic one um, they all assume that that was a nice peaceful uh, yeah, that was far from peaceful that demonstration you only have to look there? at the picture no um, 72 uh, <laughs> well, uh, but you only, you only have to look at the pictures um, I mean the Paris got dragged in purely because uh, the Royal Artillery, I think, that we're doing the, you know, they, they were losing control, and the, you know, it needed some sort of control taking. And you only have to look at all the pictures, the amount of bottles, um, bricks, and completely surrounding the floor, like you know, and and when you're under the stress, and people are, you know, trying to kill you with these um, things happen in, 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 you know, we've all seen it, like you know, but because it was, you know, these supposed innocent people. And then all their families, uh, and then you get Tony Blair apologising, or whoever, uh, might might have been Cameron actually, you know, apologised for uh, Bloody Bloody Sunday, which I don't think was the right thing to do. That should come from the military, if we feel uh, that uh, an apology is necessary. Maybe there's a precedent that needs to be, maybe there's a a thing that needs to be said that, you know, over time, I'm not just talking about military things yeah but anything really where if the only if, if if new evidence comes to light yeah if that evidence is entirely eyewitness based mm. if that's all it's based on then it doesn't get revisited yeah it's like it needs to be material like literally stuff that isn't subjective in nature yeah. it needs to be objective yeah. dna evidence yeah. video evidence yeah. anything like that because eyewitness testimony the longer time goes on is bullshit yeah it's bullshit yeah yeah you can rely on it less and less and less it goes from like a1 to like f6 yeah. and pff, what is the point and yeah. yet here we are today 
still things like that being talked about in Northern Ireland. Mm. There's no new material evidence, yeah. to my knowledge. It's all eyewitness testimony, all these, these accounts that come about. Yeah. Where they come about? How are they reliable? They're less reliable than they were then. Yeah, you yeah. I, well, I, always, I always remember the BBC um, programme uh, that came out about the SES in operations in Afghanistan. Uh, and all the eyewitnesses were, <laughs> you know, the bad people's friends, uh, you know, and, and obviously you're going to get their side of it. Uh, it's just, you know, mad. Um, I don't think people understand the stress uh, that the average squaddy goes under. Um, and bear in mind, in Northern Ireland in them days, it was quite a, quite a dangerous place to go, uh, especially in places like Belfast. Uh, and when you've got people that, that are, you know, trying to throw refrigerators or buildings to to land on you and they just miss you um, and if it does hit you that's your brown bread um, people just don't understand that side of it you know the the psychological um, effects that that has on a soldier so that when when he does have to engage or whatever um, it may be for a slightly different reason um, but but what I tried to allude to when I did that podcast with a very pro um, IRA sort of. Uh, what was following. the podcast? What was that? Yeah, well, it was uh, an American guy, a nice guy actually. Uh, he invited us on there, and he'd, he's invited the guy before me uh, was a bomber, um, you know, bomb maker for the IRA. Uh, and I just looked at um, uh, literally five minutes of it where he said, "Yeah, I used to, I used to enjoy going to bed at night knowing that my bomb was going to go off," and you're like that. Hold on. <laughs> okay, no. So, so listening to that, I thought, you know, an XSES guy needs to go on there and say, listen. And, and what it was, it was that I was trying to trying to explain to the fact that squaddies in general, they don't go to Northern Ireland and they don't wake up in the morning to say, I'm going to kill someone today, whereas the IRA do, and terrorists do. Um, squaddies don't. It, it just happens. So, an, an incident all, all occur... Um, and it'll, be, it'll either be a justifiable killing or it will be an accident that, that happens uh, an unfortunate you know and, and these things happen in warfare or in funny enough the, the previous guest um, who was sat in that chair about three hours about just about three hours ago I mean the, um, we, were, we, were, we were talking about this there but before I mention what I was just about to say talking about Northern Ireland being dangerous so it, it tailed off but it was still like it tailed off in the early noughties. I went there in 2001 and then I went there in 2005. No, 2001 and 2004. And the guy who sat there, his name's John Bream. John got John got snatched out of, the, out of his riot um, in, it was in Londonderry. And he got snatched into the crowd. He was nearly yeah. fucking gone. Yeah. Nearly fucking gone. The yeah. guy who got hold of him and managed to drag it back in, got his jaw broken. It was like nightmare scenario. Yeah. And that was 04. So I can't, I, you know, I've heard the stories of what it was like in the, in the 90s and the 80s yeah. and 90s 70s 80s and 90s yeah. crazy yeah but absolutely what we were talking about on the on the previous podcast with John is that what, what else people don't realise and civilians don't realise especially civilians who have this thing in their mind that soldiers are just cold blooded killers and special forces are just assassins mm. they're just there to do the bidding of, of the people with the money mm. they don't realise how drilled into us rules of engagement are how drilled into us escalation of forces how yeah. drilled into us the importance of hearts and minds is how drilled into us why collateral damage is bad and avoid it if yeah. you can yeah. and how how uh, drilled into us the disciplinary procedure is in there's very few instances I can think of where mm. people have done things they shouldn't have done and not had the full weight of military law come down yeah. to them yeah. very few instances I can think of you know, one I can think of, mm. and in that one instance, there was no, there was no civilian deaths. There was a civilian injury. There's one instance I know that nothing happened to this individual, yeah. and you fucking should have. But the other times, these people have been dealt with, and that's even in accidents. Yeah. Because even in the case of accidents, I'm not talking about deaths and stuff here. I'm talking about just things like not providing enough food and water to a prisoner as you should be providing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to other things like. Uh, a reservist soldier. This happened t towards the end of the uh, towards the end of the Iraq War. Reservist soldier. We had some Iraqi prisoners, and he decided to take it upon himself to dish out some physical punishment yeah. to one of our Iraqi soldiers. I was in the back of the wagon when he did that. The other four or five soldiers who were with us, power edge guys who were mm. with us, we fucking beasted him. Like didn't allow that to go on. We hammered him for. A million different reasons that shouldn't have been happening. One, because yeah. the shock and capture process yeah. and all the rest of it. And two, 
what are you doing? Mm. What, you're just battering this guy for no reason, you know. Yeah. And that, that, that's outside of the realms of formal punishment for that individual. Yeah. The team took care of that because yeah. the team, and we were all Toms, we were all privates, knew exactly shouldn't have been doing it. So it's something that civilians don't realise with yeah. the British forces. High, highly trained, highly trained in terms of killing, yes. Yeah. Highly trained in terms of don't do it if you don't need to. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, people tend to forget that the British Army are probably the forefront organisation at winning hearts and minds um, and and sadly unfortunately now um, that, that trait is slowly being lost and a lot of it is because we, we've been working with the Americans too long um, where um, uh, an example was the second Gulf War when British forces took Basra quite quickly and um, all the people, Bazaar people, all that area. I was in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. welcome the British Army, blah, 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 blah. We should have been out. Handed it straight over to the police and out and gone. Um, but because we did the American, yeah, let's, we become an occupying force. Uh, and all of a sudden, all that, that hearts and minds that you initially won, straight out of the window, uh, if that makes sense. But Northern Ireland was brilliant. I, I thought the old days of Northern Ireland were brilliant for British soldiers because we were so used to, it's a bit like the Israeli army, you know, they're on active service from the minute they join the, the military. So was the British army in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, just, just about 2000, I suppose. Uh, you know, you could go over there on a four month or a two year tour um, and you're in the thick of it straight away. And, and it just made us um, a lot more, um, Probably you tune to the fact that yeah, you know, there's some things you can do and some things you can't do, uh, especially when you're dealing with the population. Uh, just an example, my first tour in Northern Ireland with 2-9 Commando was South Armagh, um, and, and at the time, uh, Catholics were the bad people, because they're IRA, uh, and the Protestants were the good people, that, and that was the, the mentality. And it wasn't until we did the, um, the covert stuff with 14N that you realise that the majority of Catholic people are actually really nice people, and it's only a tiny <coughs> percentage that are bad people. Um, but you know what it's like when you first go over there as a, a Tom, middle of South Armagh, you know, Badlands. Um, you know, you, you took the wrong impression a bit, like you know. Yeah, I think the other thing people forget or don't realise with Ireland, um, and pay a bit of lip service to it, especially the later generations of Brit- British military who just never yeah. went there. Yeah. Uh, is that my god it was difficult it was di- regardless of what you were doing right it was difficult in that you were dealing with, an, with you're dealing with a population so a population either on side or, or not on side and an enemy yeah. say IRA whoever they were at the time you know whoever you were in that area to be in the controlling or disrupting enemy force for want of a better phrase they spoke your language they they know all the social yeah. uh, not the social the the the, uh, the visual cues they mm. like they understand how you communicate so the advantages of going into Iraq and, Af- and Afghanistan where you don't speak the language that has disadvantages it does yeah. but they also find it difficult to judge what you were saying the little unspoken signals between me and an oppo in yeah. a meeting yeah. or in the street or in a house somewhere you get away with a lot. You could not get away with that at Northern Ireland. No. Now, my experience yeah. there was limited infantry wise, but from your perspective, you know, 14 in, you probably know this mm. better than anyone I've spoke to, and certainly myself. You know, it's, uh, you, you easily get found out. I tell you what, um, and, and that was, I, I used to speak like I am now. Uh, a lot of 14 in guys, they, what they used to do is try and put on a, an Irish accent, which I thought was <laughs> bone. Because you, as soon as you talk to a, a lad in Belfast, is you're going to look at you and think, why are you trying to put on a belt? <laughs> so for me, it was just English all the time. So I had long blonde hair, big gold earring, pirate, rah, and uh, ripped jeans. Um, and if, if people um, would come up to you and, and, and cause it, you know, a bit suspicious about you, they would engage in a conversation. I would just talk and, as normal. Yeah, what's up, mate? Well, fuck off, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, never used to shy away from it because as soon as you start to shy away from if they're looking at you suspiciously and you shy all you've done is you've just confirmed what they what they they think that who you are so the way I used to get around it is just go and confront them yeah what, what's up you know what are you looking at you know blah 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 
speaking in English, um, and it's uh, and it was a good way because it, it put them on the back foot, and they thought well, obviously not a squaddy, because <laughs> the squaddy probably would have would have shuttled away like you know. Mm. And the other thing as well is um, is um, what I found out as well uh, is they're more concerned that I'm actually a Catholic or I'm actually a Protestant in uh. the other estate because we we worked North Belfast, uh, so you had the, uh, the Shankill Road. Uh, and the Shankill area, Tigers Bay, staunch Protestant, um, right next door to uh, the New Lodge, um, and also um, uh, the Ardoin, Storm, uh, you know, and they forever trying to trying to kill each other basically, and that was their major concern. So as soon as you started gobbing off in English, you could see that they. Um, probably a bit more relieved because uh, you, you're not from across in Shankill or you're not from across over in and uh, and I remember getting stopped late at night um, the IRA were putting a, a mortar together and they needed someone to do walk past in the Ardoin the Ardoin is a very close uh, environment uh, you know back uh, some of the back streets and the alleyways and stuff so I did the walk past and, uh, and we 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 knew oh so when you, for, for, for people listening they wanted they needed someone the military that walked past to confirm if yeah. something suspicious was going on or yeah not, so. they wanted to know the number of the, the garden ah, uh, if that makes sense so right. yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, at the time because this was an ongoing operation they, the normal green army were told keep out keep out of the iron door and you're not allowed in there typical British military when you get told not to go somewhere what do you normally do you come in so so i'm walking down there again scruffy looking a bit bit like a drug smuggler i suppose um and and this young uh trooper uh from a um I think cavalry regiment uh was was at the front of these poor man patrol coming down there and i thought i don't know what's he doing here um now it could have gone pear-shaped so clocked the the the, uh, the place where they yeah so, and literally about 20 feet further past is where I met up with the the patrol. Now, thankfully, in our driving licenses, um, you have a little note to say, listen, I'm a squaddy, um, treat me like you would do, and I'm armed, treat me like, like you would do anyone else. So I managed to get that across to them. And all they did, perfect, uh, bear in mind, as a young lad, uh, threw me against a wall, sort of patted me down, obviously felt the, the pistol, like, bit of an and sent me on the way. Now, that young lad could quite easily have blown that operation completely. Anyway, so it, it continued. It was fine. It sent me on the way. They sort of shuffled past and nothing done. And I met I met the young lad about three or four days later in Goodwood Barracks. Uh, we Just were, randomly? Yeah, yeah. Um, and he walked past and he, uh, and he went, fucking oh, you know, mate. He said, you're brave. And I went, not really. <laughs> I said, because they haven't got a clue who I am. <laughs> But they know who you are, uh, and I said it's you people that are in your uniform. Um, you're the easy targets, like you know. So, so for us, it's not a thing about bravery um, because they, they haven't got a clue. And I've got my pistol. You know, my pistol is my get out of jail card if anything happens. But the the British Army in them days, I used to feel sorry for the British Army in Northern Ireland because they never used to get any intelligence whatsoever, and they were just walking targets ready to be taken on. Uh, by the IRA, like you know, pretty pretty shocking because mm. all the good intelligence obviously went to uh, special forces or, or or the police or whatever, like you know, mm. and then all the, all the crappy intelligence that nobody could be asked with, you'd pass it on to the to the Green Army. So the Green Army were really in the firing line, uh, I would say, mm. uh, Northern Ireland, much much more than you know special forces or whatever. Like uh, special forces get all the all the glory. Uh, because they've got the intelligence to, to deal with some of it. But it's the poor old Green Army that are out there day in, day out, you know, trying to find intelligence, trying to find some of it that, that's worthy. But nine times out of ten, the, you know, nothing happens like, you know, and, and every now and then the poor lad will get shot dead like, you know, because he's, mm. he's in an area. Um, and, and that's just a sad side of Northern Ireland, I suppose. Yeah. But, I, but I didn't realise that uh, until... I started doing all the undercover stuff, like, you know, you realise that, you know, your the intelligence that you're actually getting is way more than, than what the what the other people are like, you know. Yeah. But enjoyable, I, I, I must admit, I 
I thoroughly enjoyed undercover type work because because it was different. You know, it was um, you know you, you you're not reliant on other people. You know, because you get yourself in trouble in undercover. Unfortunately, you need to get yourself out of it because otherwise you'll end up like them two signals lads. Um, and it's quite funny because where them two lads got picked up. Uh, oh, it was in the Shankill area, was it not? No, it was uh, Anderson Town, Andy Town. Anderson Town, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was Andy Town. I, literally, a few years later, I broke down uh, in a deck car in Andy Town. Um, and in the vehicle, uh, there was a G3 in the boots, uh, there was a shotgun on the back seat, there was a car pistol uh, in the, the door thing. Uh, so quite a lot of quite a lot of firepower in there. Yeah, if that makes sense. So, anyway, because of all the all the gadgets that we've got on the car, uh, you know, the um, uh, the old smoke bombs underneath and all that lot. Um, there's a lot of there's a good chance your car's going to go tits up every now and then. <laughs> and I actually broke down on uh, Andy, Andy Town Road, um, and so I jumped out. And there's two young lads really who who were just and I said, just favourite lads, you know, in my, typically. Can you help me push the car? And they did. And I was just thinking. I wonder if they actually knew, <laughs> you yeah, know, what's yes. in this car, like, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but friendly as hell, like, you know, yeah. which, which really just sums up um, the average Catholic person in, in Anderson Town. Because mm-hmm. everyone goes on about, you know, a bit of a feeding frenzy when them two lads go, but uh, there was a lot of circumstances around that, um, that that caused that to go off, like, you know. Do you want to go into it? Can you go into it? Yeah, I, I suppose. I mean, it was two lads who shouldn't have been in the area in the in the first place. It was it was an out of bounds area, um, but but it was one lad showing the other lad uh, of where to go, and they uh, really unlucky um, because a lot of the roads have been cordoned off, and um, and because they were driving back to Lisbon, I think, which is where they were based, uh, they just. They ended up in a funeral procession, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, and it was for one of the... IRA guy. Yeah, uh, Gibraltar, uh, one of those Gibraltar. Oh, it yeah. was, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, tensions yeah, were yeah, tensions shit. were quite high, uh, if that makes sense. So so because of that, um, you know, and, and uh, then all of a sudden you get this vehicle, but because nobody in the military, so you've got the helicopter videoing all this, uh, and, and, and we've seen the footage, and, it, and it's pretty sickening. Uh, to watch it, you know, watch what these pit, another human being can do to another individual. Um, they they didn't have a clue. So, uh, have we got any army units down there? No. So it must be a Protestant, uh, you know, thing. So, so there was no emergency response to get uh, in there and sort it out. I didn't realise it's two of our guys. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So everything conspired against them. Them two lads, like you know. Um, but it, but it, it, in a in a weird way, it, it changed our mindset when we operated uh, as a debt um, that you would never never get yourself in that position because before then you'd actually start shooting people. Um, and the reason being is you have to when you're in a situation like that you have to draw a line in the sand, uh, and the first person that's going to get it is the most aggressive individual because all you need to do is is just remember what these people are going to do to you um bear in mind that they actually thought they were in the SES. um so there's there's no going down that route like you know so you what just you take mean? them out what do you, you mean what do you mean they thought they were in the SES? well they actually because they one of them had a, a naffy card that said hereford uh, on there so they assumed the crowd thought they were yeah oh, Christ yeah they, assu- they assumed that they'd got two uh two SES operators like you know uh which probably caused even more frenzy so, uh, and because they had quite longish hair as well, uh, they're on a signals attachment, like you know. So, it, everything. Were they two six four? Were they? Uh, no, no, no. Just dead. normal. Yeah, normal, yeah. normal signals uh, guy. Oh, normal. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Nothing. Oh, I thought they were dead. Okay. No, 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 no. And uh, yeah, it's just yeah, because uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of military units still operate civilian clothing without, but there's yeah. certain areas that they, you shouldn't be in, mm. uh, and that just happened to be one of them. Uh, but everything went against them. Everything, um, you know, no army units there, so it can't be us. Uh, so there's no quick response going to come in, because uh, you know, as far as that, I mean, it could have been an internal uh, type. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, so yeah, everything. But sadly, yeah, and and it, it it's one of them instances that yeah, because it was on TV and and it sort of played out. Uh, it's just one of them instances that you you always look back on and thinking, could we have done more? Could the helicopter have done? 
but then you look at the helicopter and uh, because you only react on the intelligence you're given uh, and if it's nope not military you know because mm. because I've no doubt that all the debts would have said that's none of our people uh, the regiment uh, no no uh, we're not down there oh, you know mm. who is it last question to round it off mate uh, national service yes or no uh, big fat no, ah, uh, and uh, no. The reason being uh, is there are there's organisations in the country at the moment that um, people that want to join the army uh, they go through and, uh, and and it's taught at colleges and stuff like that. So they you can do a two year course uh, and it's all geared towards joining the military. Uh, is pump the money into them because you, you're getting people, young people that actually want to be in the army. Um, and it's always it's, it's true what they say you know one volunteer is better than 10 press men <laughs> so for me it's a no no um, and the reason being is that, you know w- the military don't have the infrastructure to fight a war let alone <laughs> train and teach all these these civilians yeah the infrastructure is the problem the yeah. infrastructure is the problem isn't it uh, Matt I've really enjoyed it well, how can people get hold of Hawks and Co yeah, uh, so we're on a we're on a we've got a website uh, that I'll I'll, uh, I'll give me a card after this. So oh you yeah, can, I'll, you can well, I'll put the website yeah. in the blurb of this podcast anyway. Yeah, um, so yeah, uh, so you get us on the on a on the we've got our own website. Um, we're we're very heavy into LinkedIn. <laughs> we're quite vocal on LinkedIn. Uh, some people like it, some people don't because we tend to tell the truth. Uh, we tend not to hold back uh, on on you know what we think is right and what's wrong. Uh, we're also now on Instagram. Uh, there's a lot of our stuff. Uh, there's a guy actually looks after my Instagram account. Um, uh, someone far more technical than what I am. Uh, so he's actually building our our um, our sort of the people followers and all that sort of mm-hmm. lot on there. So so we're doing quite a lot on that. Um, I've got um, um, so. Uh, I've got my, my daughter's lot because I've got three lads in the military and that was the reason we started Hawks and Co. You've got three boys? Yeah. And all of them in the military? Three military. <laughs> I know, bizarre. I've got my own, my own gun team. But but that, that was the thing about when I was in uh, trying to build a legacy. So the idea was to, um, so when I'm, so I'm 65 now, so when I'm 75 and I'm bored and I'm ready to retire, because certainly not yet, I'm still 25 in the head, uh, is to hand it over to my daughter and to the kids, Hawks and Co. And then they've got, you know, if if they're at a loose end, they can carry on the training and, and stuff like that. Because the, the important thing about Hawks and Co. Um, is about helping people, you know, especially kids being safe on the on the streets and stuff like that. Um, and also farmers and stuff like that. So we're, we're, we're trying to be slightly different to you know what other companies do Uh, and that's why i started it because you know 24 years corporate security i've seen the bad side of security companies um and it's uh, a horrible industry i I uh, used to own a small security company and uh i worked in the industry for a few not not 22 years worked in the industry for a few years when i left and then set up a security company with myself and two others and i i like you, I got an insight into the way other security companies. It, for me, it was the attitude, the yeah. attitude on them. It yeah. is not a, it is not a very a, a, an industry of companies full of integrity or authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you alluded to earlier it is all about how much how much they can make at the expense of the customer most yeah. of the time. Yeah. Whether that's door staff on yeah. a pump, yeah. or whether that's um, you know. Uh, I don't know some EP stuff in London looking after a family in London I know I'm generalizing you but that is what most of it is like and yeah. that, the problem is that rubs off on the employees and the contracts in the industry yeah. it's horrendous yeah. it's horrendous and it actually puts off people uh, so going back to the farmer you, you give an invoice to a farmer that this is how much it's going to cost you they'll look at it they'll rip it up and nothing gets done um, and what do we start but if you was to say listen it's not going to cost you anything. We're, you know, we're going to help you out here. Then they'll improve their security because they know it's not going to not going to cost them a small fortune. Mm. Security and uh, security companies need to understand that it's not all about making money. It's about helping people. Um, and but but that attitude brings it enables growth and yeah. enables you know uh, 
but if you it puts the industry whichever industry it is it puts it it gives it a better public reputation yeah. right which yeah. brings more business to the fucking industry yeah absolutely. you know what i mean the security industry who ran the thing that we did yesterday for all the kiddies uh the finance girl said mick um what what are your rates for doing this i said the uh, simple fact is how much are you paying all the others uh she went oh blah blah i said we'll go we'll go with that um who am I to sort of demand this amount of money when you're paying these people that? So, so and that and that's really how it should be. You know, if you're paying them that amount of money, then then we're happy because we're doing the same job. You know, it was five different stands or whatever. Um, not not just quote some ridiculous amount of money just because you you're going down there like you know. So, yeah, well, uh, you know, for us, for me, it's it's a, an attitude that I don't want to go away. We're struggling, um, you know, it's because we're competing against the big boys, we are struggling. Um, I can't get a job in the security industry because, you know, probably deemed a, a bit of a loose cannon, I suppose, or I, uh, people don't want to employ. Classic one, I got interviewed for a job, um, and the guy that was interviewing me uh, had been in his job, head of security, for two years. I've been head of security for 15 years. Um, and he, he, the, the feedback at the end of it was, we, we don't think you've got enough corporate experience. <laughs> yeah, really? That's what you got out of the interview. And it, and it was a pathetic, you know, because he reads a few questions. And he, you know, he was picking it up and reading it and without even looking. And you're like, that, that's, that's not an interview. You know, mm. you, this, this is an interview. This, yeah. is how, this is how you understand people not reading a flipping load of lines and, yeah. and then coming back with that shite that you're not, uh, you know, and uh, uh, someone said to me, Ginger Johnson, good friend of mine, he said, mate, what it is, they're probably concerned that you'll go in there and then they'll realise how shite they are um, because they're not doing it the right way. Um, so that, that's always in the back of my head. So, yeah, no, no one will touch me. Um, because of your background, because of your experience and everything else. Yeah, but do what you do, mate. Just put put, put yourself in a position. Yeah. Where you can you can you yeah. can be your own boss. We can you say, know yeah. what I mean? Bollocks off to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, when's the book out? Yeah, so the book. Hopefully, the book will be out um, by. So it's it's called Life on the Edge. Um, it's it's got to go to the military uh, so that they can they can see the thing. There, there's nothing on there really. That uh, there's no big secrets. It's all it's a life story to help help people get themselves sorted. Hoping to get it out uh, by uh, by March next year, so that it's in time for the Hay Festival. Perfect. Been a pleasure. Thanks for your time. Uh, no, uh, thanks for thanks for inviting us down. I really enjoyed. Any time. Yeah. <laughs> next time you're in town, let's do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, apart from that traffic. What the? Fuck? <laughs> you, you came into Central London in a car. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, the, the thing is about a car. At least you're guaranteed. Uh, you, you can't guarantee on a train anymore. And I live back right out in the sticks, so I would have, it would have cost me a fortune in uh, yeah. taxi drives. And, oh, yeah, true. Uh, so, yeah, true. No, perfect. But, yeah, thanks, thanks for the invite. Much appreciated. No problem.